Thank you, Rosemary. And um, yes, it's the first conference that Judith hasn't been here. Um, one great advantage of talking at the end of the conference is that um, I can see that what I'm about to say uh, intersects with quite a lot of the wonderful presentations that you've been listening to, um, including, well, even, uh, you know, I got here on uh, Thursday and found that David Beatty was showing some film clips which I'm going to be using a little bit in this talk. Um, there are other points of intersection with uh, Ross's marvellous session on Friday with some of the things that Philip Norman said, uh, with Gillian's session this morning actually, which I thoroughly <coughs> enjoyed, and, um, and also in a way with the superb performance that we heard on Thursday night from Martin Risley and Jan Liu of the Lil Byrne Sonata. And I <coughs> just, I was talking to Rosemary before and said, you know, I don't know whether I should tell an anecdote about my experience with that sonata or not, and she urged me to. So here goes. Um, I learned that sonata with Bruce Greenfield when I was an undergraduate at Vic, and Douglas coached us on it. And this is going to relate a little bit to, to the talk. He said, um, the first thing he said to us when he listened to us play it through the very first time was, um, well, that opening page, he said, you've been to the South Island, um, you just need to think of the mountains. So that's, that was an interesting thing. And then I went off to, uh, to, to England as a postgraduate student, and after I'd been there for about a year, I was doing a concert with a pianist, and I persuaded the pianist to learn the Lil Byrne Sonata with me. And word got back to Douglas about this through John Mansfield Thompson. So I arrived into my college in Oxford for the concert, and walked through into this very, very beautiful, basically 17th century courtyard, place where incidentally I was very happy. I really liked being there. And the first thing I saw as I walked into the quadrangle was Douglas and John Mansfield Thompson walking around the quad. And Douglas came up to me and he said, what on earth are you doing in a place like this? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that, re that remark, uh, kind of resonated with me. It was a very important thing to say to me at that time. I've, I, you know, I, was, I thought it was such a wonderful thing for this composer, whom I just admired uh, sort of boundlessly, to be identifying me as a New Zealander. And sort of implication was, you know, your destiny lies in New Zealand. So it was nice being happy in Oxford, but going back. So uh, there'll be a sort of connection with the talk. I'm going to start the talk properly now. <laughs> So Hugh McDonald's This Is New Zealand, three-screen movie, attracted long queues outside cinemas when it was brought home at the conclusion of the World Expo in, in Osaka, for which it was created. The sense of pride in this technologically brilliant and scenically splendid representation of life in Aotearoa was immense. Nevertheless, there was a question tinged with disappointment um, that many of us asked, the sort of musically interested people in the audience asked, why did they use Sibelius rather than Lilburn to characterise the grandeur of our landscape? Um, Lilburn himself, sorry, Lilburn himself did not question the choice of composer, though in 1975 he criticised the National Film Unit's budget-driven reliance on pre-recorded LPs for its soundtracks, and he said this achieved apotheosis. They achieved apotheosis of their musical outlook in the Expo 70 film, This Is New Zealand. <coughs> so on the face of it, his criticism was just about the using pre-recorded music instead of doing something special for the film. The use of music intended to evoke the landscape of Karelia, whose highest point, incidentally, is 576 metres. <laughs> Roughly the, the height of Kau Kau. Um, seems doubly inappropriate uh, in light of the fact that in 1950, uh, Douglas had composed music for the film Journey for Three about life in New Zealand that, like the Expo offering, 
used the awe-inspiring Southern Alps as its trump card. New Zealand, eh? Not much to look at, is it? Wonderful line. Um, <laughs> Douglas gave a radio talk introducing excerpts from, the, from his score for Journey for Three, and he concluded this talk with the, with the wish that other New Zealand composers might have more opportunity to learn this rather specialised job of writing for films. For us composers, he wrote, it's a, ver oh, said, it's a very pleasant and valuable type of work. I'm sure that the underwriting of visual images of the things immediate to our ways of life helps us to develop a contemporary and characteristic style, the underwriting of visual images of things immediate to our ways of life. For Journey to Three, as you've just seen, uh, Douglas conducted the National Orchestra, described there as the National Symphony Orchestra, which was then in its third year and still sounding pretty much like a novice ensemble. These days, um, the NZSO is internationally noted for its film soundtrack recordings, though that reputation depends more on Howard Shaw's vacuous accompaniments for Peter Jackson's movies than on any New Zealand scores. There are a few films with music by New Zealanders. Uh, this one, Good for Nothing, great movie, with a, with a score by John Pesathis, and Under the Mountain with, by, with music by Victoria Kelly, just to name two. Uh, Robert Hoskins has included the score that for the climax of the journey for three music is an appendix to the beautiful volume that he's just edited of Douglas Lilburn, Memories of Early Years and Other Writings. And, um, you know, as, as you've heard, it's got affinities with pieces like Aotearoa. What virtually every piece of writing in this volume illustrates is Lilburn's wrestling with the question of what it meant to be, or what it means to be, a New Zealand composer. Some of the essays, the one now called A Search for a Sound, show acute awareness of contemporary movements in Europe, a sense too that as a university-based composer in the 1950s and 60s, he was constantly having to play catch-up. This is something that Ross touched on the other day. His lifelong mission seems to have been to find the right musical response to the New Zealand landscape and character, a quest that in the 1960s, as we know, led him to elect electroacoustic music and the opening in 1966 of the first professional electronic studio in Australasia. The core of Robert Hoskin's volume is made up of a series of talks that Lilburn gave between 1946 and 1969, and some of these are quite familiar. They've been published twice before, or the two most important ones have, I think. Um, and that span between 1946 uh, with um, A Search for Tradition and 1969 with A Search for a Language um, is an interesting one given that it's the period that goes from A Song of Islands to the Third Symphony and The Return. The only significant later writing included in that new volume is um, the uh, nostalgic, though richly informative, <laughs> memories of early years, which um, were compiled between 1986 and 1988 and it seems, since he sent a draft off to James Bertram for comment, that he probably intended this for publication. 
Lil Burn's compositional growth aside, the talks reflect a period in which change in New Zealand society seems relatively slow. And this is where I think the films that uh, Douglas composed music for are really illuminating. So in addition to Journey for Three, uh, Douglas composed music for half a dozen short films produced by the National Film Unit in its most creative period, and I think many of you will have seen some of these on uh, Thursday afternoon. What interests me here is Lilburn's sense that in composing for the National Film Unit, he was being given an opportunity, as he put it, to underwrite visual images of things immediate to our ways of life. The problem is that our ways of life were somewhat different 65 years ago when these films were being made. So the 45 minute Journey for Three, directed by Michael Forlong, uh, is populated entirely by Pākehā, either new British immigrants who are the subject of the film, or Kiwis of longer standing. The only Māori in the film is um, true to a stereotype we wouldn't have much to do with now. He's a practical joker who thinks that nearly running over the newly arrived Pommy is hell of a good fun, and that's Douglas's own description in the radio talk, hell of a good fun. Um, <coughs> The uh, weekly review number 346, Rhythm and Movement, from 1948, isn't even more exclusively Pākehā affair. And I'd be tempted to describe it as Aryan, were it not that the choreographer at the heart of the enterprise was Jisa Taglicht, who had arrived in New Zealand in 1939 as a Jewish refugee from Nazi-occupied Austria. Young woman in Taglicht's YWCA class, accompanied by Lilburn's solo flute writing, glide gracefully in short skirts, one of which dissolves to show fluid, well-exercised back muscles. This caused a little bit of comment in 1940. <laughs> After a day's hard work, whether in a factory or in the home, we change to movements that loosen up our cramped limbs. known as rhythmical gymnastics, are to encourage good health and perfect body control. Unlike the physical jerks of yesterday, these exercises develop the body as a coordinated unit, and relaxing and swinging movements like these use all the muscles with the spine as the center of movement. They give the whole body freedom and suppleness and beauty. But rhythmical gymnastics are not limited to a few movements, and the pleasure of doing the exercises is increased by their variety. Very censored. Um, um, <clears throat> one of the most fascinating of the, of the Lilburn clips or films is a 23 minute documentary produced by the National Film Unit for the Department of Education entitled The First Two Years at School. This appeared in 1950, which was the midpoint of Dr. Clarence Beebe's term as Director of Education when New Zealand educational reforms, and in particular our championing of the playway, were attracting international attention. And I do just want to show you one short clip from this film. Here is a different kind of play. These little girls are doing the family washing. They're learning how to do something. Yes, and more than that. In this imaginative play, they're reliving the experiences of the grown-ups at home and getting some understanding of them. In the Wendy house this morning, there's a lot of work to be done. While one mother takes the baby for an airing, other housewives are setting the table and dressing the children. Here again, they're getting an insight into what the grown-up world is like. 
naughty, bad child. How many times have I told you not to do that? She's dramatizing something that's happened in her own life. This is one way that small children are able to take the sting out of their pent-up feelings of anger or shame. A brief gardening sequence halfway through the film is the only scene to feature children of anything other than European ethnicity. Maori children ho and rake, while one little Chinese girl tends foxgloves. Apparently the director, Margaret S. Thompson, having filmed at a mainly Pākehā school in Wellington, made a conscious effort to find some Māori children, and uh, the Pacific children and any other ethnicities are completely unrepresented. Māori do, however, feature strongly in another of the National Film Unit's um, weekly review, many documentaries for which Douglas composed music. The, the little film called Hokianga Black Bo Black sorry, Backblock Medical Service, made in 1948, <coughs> depicts doctors and nurses, all Pākehā, tending, actually there might be one Māori nurse in there, um, but mostly Pākehā for sure. So it depicts doctors and nurses tending to the needs of a totally Māori population in the north. On the face of it, this is a promotional magazine item on the good work being carried out by some very dedicated and idealistic doctors and paramedics. Backblock Medical Service, um, also directed by, by Michael Furlong, is remarkably candid about the problems that beset poor rural communities, overcrowded houses and poor conditions, unhealthy diets and so on. The dilapidated houses, broken jetties and tatty, tatty clothing are on a par with Anne Arnswester's 1964 wash day at the Pa, which as you know, after complaints in the Maori Women's Welfare League, was recalled and shredded by its publisher, the Department of Education. The difference is that in Backblock Medical Service, it, that, that that is a paternalistic story of poor Māori being, being rescued by Pākehā professionals. Douglas's music for Backblock Medical Service is in some ways the most interesting of these film scores. It, it progresses from newsreel cliché at the beginning with the sort of bustling music as a nurse's car speeds along country roads um, to music that responds eloquently to the suffering and anxiety of a poor whanau with a critically ill um, child. The case is serious. The symptoms indicate acute appendicitis and the nurse has decided to take the patient straight to hospital. Hospital has been warned. A car is waiting at Rome. Some things haven't changed since those times. Child poverty and illness in the far north is sadly still a current issue. But in the 65 years or so since those films were made, we've had um, people like Germaine Greer, who, as you know, was arrested for saying bullshit at a rally here in 1972. Um, so people like, well, Germaine Greer and others have helped change a culture in which it had seemed okay to show six-year-old girls in training for motherhood in the suburbs. Our Crimes Amendment Act in 2007 has ensured that no commentator would now dare to say in approving times that in smacking the doll, the little girl was dramatizing something that had happened in her own life. <laughs> uh, Miley Cyrus music videos have made Jesus G Giza Taglik's uh, movement class seem wholesomely decorous. <laughs> um, Dr. Beebe's enlightened educational policies have been replaced by a regime of national standards, for better or for worse. 
we find it harder to look on the massively destructive hydro schemes um, like Waitaki featured in the journey for, tr for three with such unqualified admiration and approval. And how wrong-headed does it now seem to have claimed, as Douglas did in 1969, that we're just, and I quote, a bunch of welfare state addicts with too much being done for us and too few pressures to goad us into work and hammer us into wisdom. Most of all, the demography of New Zealand has changed radically. Margaret Thompson would have had no difficulty now in finding ethnically diverse classrooms even in Wellington, and Auckland has recently been rated as one of the most diverse cities in the world, and it is, of course, the largest Polynesian city anywhere. The final of Chamber Music New Zealand's school chamber music competition is these days dominated by Asian New Zealanders. I think there was only one, um, as it were, person of European extraction in the last final down in Christchurch last year. <coughs> the land marches, Waitangi tribunal settlements and other factors have, I, I think and hope, helped us move towards a more genuine partnership between Māori and Pākehā. So the flurry of filmmaking to which Lilburn contributed in the late 1940s illustrates a New Zealand that is worlds away from the society in which we now live. You know that L.P. Hartley thing, the past is another country. Um, <clears throat> this realisation must surely colour our reading of passages like the following, and this is one that um, Ross referred to in his talk the other day. It's possible to believe that Bach or Beethoven wrote the greatest music ever written or likely to be written. That the music is what we like to call universal and that the deepest reaches of spirit we know in ourselves can be discovered in and through this music. Yet I think there are parts of our personalities and conditions of living here that at this present time cannot be identified with this music. Perhaps I can explain this by giving you a personal instance. And then there's that anecdote that um, Ross mentioned we are travelling up on the Limited to um, Frankton to go to the Cambridge Music School. He s put his head out as they were going through the spiral. And at that moment, he says, the world, of Mo the world Mozart lived in seemed as remote as the moon and in no way related to my experience. I want to plead with you the necessity of having a music of our own, a living tradition of music created in this country, a music that will satisfy those parts of, our, parts of our being that cannot be satisfied by the music of other nations. Music has been written here and is being written here, but I feel that all, I feel that all of it is only the most tentative beginnings towards solving the problem I've put to you, the discovery of our own identity. Now, if I may be allowed one little digression, I was in Salzburg for a conference in the middle of last year um, and of course did not have Douglas's essays in my mind at all. But I, all the time I was there, I just kept looking up at the hills and thinking, surely Mozart responded to this as a New Zealander would. You know, it's sort of like Arrowtown or uh, one of those, you know, and you just, I just kept wondering about Mozart's childhood and just growing up amidst those hills. And so, I know I'm making a claim here for uh, Mozart to be made an honorary New Zealander, <laughs> <laughs> which would please me greatly, but actually, you know, um, I, I think that the landscape to which Mozart, well, we don't know whether he's responding to it or not, but it's a landscape that resonates with New Zealanders, I feel. But going back to what Douglas says in this uh, extended passage from the search for tradition, here responsiveness to our landscape is conflated with what he assumed to be a broad consensus about, the atti about our attitudes, New Zealanders' attitudes to more or less anything, matters relating to, and I quote again, our personalities and conditions of living here at the present time. The accelerating effects of climate change aside, the landscape hasn't changed much since 1946, but our personalities and conditions of living here certainly have. So Douglas introduces the idea that music written by New Zealanders might not be as brilliant in absolute terms as, what, as, as works that have become an established part of the canon, but might nevertheless be of more consequence and value to us as people. I'll return to this idea, and it's one that's 
much favoured today and reflected in government funding policies. Quite reasonably, Douglas felt then that that was already the situation in relation to literature, as Sargison and Kurnow had things to say that would resonate with us very strongly as New Zealanders. The vision of a national identity that's given musical expression, so strongly voiced in 1946 in A Search for Tradition, became progressively more complicated for Douglas. His 1967 talk to the Christchurch Society for Contemporary Music asked the question, what is contemporary music? And as a partial answer, sketched something of the stylistic diversity evident internationally at the time. And then just two years, years later in a search for a language, he acknowledged that that diversity was also evident in the work of New Zealand composers. This is one of the things he says there. Our composers each speak their personal language with a craftsmanship that I admire. But if I were listening in an overseas context, I doubt whether any two of them would give me a common factor by which I could identify their origin. Some of them, I suspect, might take this as a compliment, a token of their in internationalism. He was aware too of what we've come to call the anxiety of influence, the phenomenon of composers or writers, painters, whatever, being so determined not to be influenced by a dominant figure that they strike out in de a deliberately different direction. Reflecting on the response to his Cambridge Music School talk, Search for Tradition, in his Otago University lecture, he said, I find it difficult to trace any main line of development or to forecast one, still less to put forward a personal view as to what I think we ought or ought not to be doing at this point in time. 22 years ago, I was rash enough to do this, and if there was any response at all, it was simply one of reaction. As a teacher, I've come to respect this power of reaction. It seems to me that the most uh, striking example of a very gifted composer determined not to follow in Douglas's footsteps is Jack Body. Jack was a close personal friend of Douglas's and yet turned for his musical inspiration primarily to a range of Asian musical traditions. In the afterword to the Lilburn Residence Trust's edition of A Search for Tradition and A Search for Language, Jack took Douglas's abandoning of the quest for a style that would recognisably ours one step further. Oh, sorry. He said, um, for the composers of today, Lilburn's 1946 dream of a shared vernacular seems a rather irrelevant concept. There had, of course, been attempts uh, to give New Zealand composition a distinctively New Zealand character, and again, Gillian touched on some of this this morning. Douglas was interested in the work of Alfred Hill, writing that, I disagree um, with Alfred Hill's attitude to Māori music, but I admire him for his belief that the country is capable of producing a distinctive music and for showing us that even in those earlier days it was possible for a composer to live here and produce work that could gain recognition elsewhere. In his search for tradition, uh, Douglas had elaborated on his reservations about attempts to incorporate um, the music of Māori into classical composition. He understood the need to distinguish between traditional Māori chant and the more popular songs that have been embraced as part of the concert party uh, movement. And I won't bother reading that to you now, but it's quite an interesting and um, a, a alert reflection on the, uh, the, the problems of trying to incorporate genuine Māori material into, um, as it were, Western classical composition. When he turned to electroacoustic music, Douglas made tentative steps to acknowledge the character of traditional Māori chant, most notably the something very reminiscent of a karanga in The Return. But even then, he was uncertain about the validity of this approach, writing in a search for a language that, I've become very aware that the natural sounds of this environment exist in their own right, as do the songs and chants of our Māori tradition, intractable, not to be won easily into any <coughs> synthesis. Of course, uh, in recent years, our composers have embraced traditional Māori material with enthusiasm and I think with a, a, a informed by perhaps a much uh, more acute understanding of the, the nature of the tradition and the material that they're dealing with. So um, Gareth Farr incorporates a karanga into his Te Papa, written in, in uh, 1998 for the opening of the museum. 
way back, Ross included quite a lot of uh, Maori material in Waituhi, wonderful opera. Since Lil Burn's death, there's been a veritable flood of um, works that incorporate Taonga Puro. So searching under Taonga Puro on the Marvelous Sounds website <laughs> produces currently 155 results. I mean, that's, that's significant. A couple of them are not actually compositions. There's a, you know, there's a book and so on gets in there, but uh, the Brian Flintoff book it, it takes up one entry. But you've got over 150 compositions currently registered that use um, Taonga Puro, and some of these uh, have been really um, you know, very distinguished compositions. Gillian Whitehead has, as you know, incorporated these very evocative sounds into a number of compositions. And uh, once again, uh, Ross in the Requiem for, for the Fallen uh, premiered in the festival last year and about to be done in the Auckland Festival, uh, uses them, integrates them very successfully with um, string quartet, uh, vocal forces and so on. Douglas did not really elaborate on his reservations about Alfred Hill's use of Maori music, but it seems to me quite likely that he felt uncomfortable with Hill's almost unwitting assimilation of what he believed to be traditional indigenous material into a mainstream late 19th century style where it just becomes, you know, kind of part of the, the mush really. I mean, you know, Waiata Poi, Hill's arrangement of it is, was a sort of hit in Australia along with all sorts of other stuff that, you know, just is kind of blanded out. Um, <clears throat> So there may be similar dangers surrounding the use of Tāna Puro. Uh, we should be grateful to Brian Flintoff, Richard Nunns, Hirini Melvin and others for restoring these artefacts and allowing them once again to become part of our consciousness as musically interested New Zealanders. But at the same time, the question I keep wondering about, uh, you know, I'm fascinated by the way in which the sounds that we're hearing from these instruments align so seamlessly with various sets of current stylistic and sonic trends. And I think we should be just a little bit suspicious about that. Um, there seems to have been an increasing interest in the 21st century. Sorry, I'm off on another tack now. There seems to have been increasing interest in the 21st century within various societies, not just our own, uh, in fostering distinctive musical identity. So in 2012, this is just a couple of examples, 2012, the Melbourne Festival ran a series of talks on the topic, how do we see ourselves a question of identity? Uh, in the same year, um, the Aspen Festival used American Made as its overriding theme. Uh, a few months later, the Institute of Musical Research in England held a conference on expressions of Britishness, music and arts in the 20th century. Here at home, successive governments and cultural funding agencies have embraced the idea of a distinctive New Zealand culture as self-evidently <coughs> desirable. So the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra Act, passed in 2004, listed among the principal objectives of the orchestra the fostering of and the development of a distinctively New Zealand cultural environment. The 2006 to 2008 Helen Clark Labor government defined three overriding focuses or foci I suppose you say for policy uh, the third of which was national identity. You remember that, um, that, that Helen Clark and her um, cabinet wanted to group all their main policy initiatives under these three headings and one of them was national identity. Um, Creative New Zealand uh, has continued a commitment to promoting, and I've circled it here, New Zealand's distinctive voice. This is just from a page about their international policy. Um, the Ministry for Culture and Heritage <coughs> in their final report on the review of the professional orchestra sector noted approvingly that most submissions had supported the proposition that we should encourage New Zealand contribution and that, that, yeah, that we should be contributing to a distinctive, New Zealand's distinctive culture. Um, just passing very quickly over the possibly sinister implications of this kind of 
policy, and there are many other examples. Um, <coughs> um, I am struck by the way in which that cl the claim that distinctiveness is self-evidently good coincides with the piece-by-piece -piece relinquishing of aspects of sovereignty through economic globalization, articulated through free trade agreements and other legislation. So I've popped on this one, for example, the Crown Minerals Amendment Act, which means that you can't protest if a multinational is drilling off your coast, or at least you can't go within a certain distance of the, uh, of the drills. Um, so, it, you know, we've got, um, and, and those other bills, the security intelligence bills and so on, we're giving away aspects of our sovereignty, of our right to define our own character and future as New Zealanders, um, piece by piece. So, um, should we be concerned that the pressure to create a Kiwi identity um, might be a smokescreen to hide the erosion of true sovereignty. Um, I, for one, will not be flying any flag, old or new, um, since that kind of patriotism seems irrelevant and insidious. I was struck that in 2011, thanks to the Rugby World Cup, we were supposed to be a stadium of four million people, and in the same year we produced the lowest voter turnout in any general election for decades. Um, so I'm personally not that interested in distinctiveness. I prefer quality, but may I add that I'm hugely proud of what our composers are achieving, and I want to end, really, with two personal stories. I should have told Ross not to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to my NZSO days. When we were planning the NZSO's 2010 Euro European tour, I wanted to ensure that we would have New Zealand music well represented on our programmes. Douglas's Aotearoa Overture had been eagerly accepted by a number of European promoters. You understand that the way this worked was um, we were going out to the, the, the people running concerts in a di diverse number of European cities and offering them various programmes. And actually in that process, uh, the list that we were offering shrunk. And it wasn't just the New Zealand music list, you know, we went out initially with, I think, five different symphonies on offer, and it shrunk to two, um, because the ultimate decision is, you know, the, the willingness of the people buying the concert, so to speak, to program that music. So Douglas's name is known, uh, and we were um, very proud to have the Aotearoa Overture on the front of a number of programs, and I was going to play you that from the music for Ryan was one of the most emotional moments in my life to hear our guys in, in that setting playing to a full house who obviously loved it. Um, so we had Aotearoa, we had a movement from David Farquhar's Ring Around the Moon up our sleeves as an encore, but it was pretty hard to get these promoters interested in more recent New Zealand compositions. So um, I talked to Ross. I also talked to my wife, Catherine, who agreed that we could commission this. So I went to Ross and said, how about writing a set of pieces that would reflect on the musical traditions of some of the cities in which the NZSO would be playing? Thinking, well, how could you know, a city like Mannheim, for example, to just to choose an example that Ross did not take up, but how could a city like Mannheim um, resist a piece that is somehow about themselves? Um, and the result, as you can see, were three very beautiful pieces, one called Vienna, in brackets, Mahler, another called Luzern, in brackets, Wagner, and the third called Schumann, uh, or, or rather, I think it ended up as Dusseldorf, in brackets, Schumann. Um, and the strategy worked, more or less. Um, we played them as a, as a set in, on the way to Europe, in Shanghai, and then they got dotted through the, the, the various other programs, with Lucerne Wagner being the hot favourite. <coughs> um, so these pieces were written by a New Zealander, um, and uh, they do not exemplify that shimmer of a distinctively New Zealand sound. 
um, actually, you know, they're, a, they're kind of drawing, if they're drawing on any traditions at all, they're those traditions illustrated in the title. But I should have done a blind tasting at the beginning of this hour because I reckon that if I'd played them to you, um, they do represent a distinctively Ross Harris sound. I think that we now know enough of Ross's music, even though I think, as Julia pointed out in introducing Ross the other day, uh, there's a, you know, a huge range. He's quite eclectic in some ways, but nevertheless, there's a very distinctive character to his music, and I think that you would hear that, and I'm very pleased about that. Here's another anecdote which is not quite so good in a way, and I'm going to um, leave the names here out completely. But as you may remember, in 2011, New Zealand was the featured country at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, I was quite keen to try and take an ensemble from the NZSO to the Frankfurt Book Fair. It didn't work out in the end, but um, I thought we needed to be part of that celebration. And we devised a couple of programs that had literary connections because of the uh, nature of the thing. And one of these programs, one had New Zealand music in it, the other was an exclusively New Zealand program. And I thought, well, there's something missing here, and that's uh, a piece that is going to really mark this as something special. So let's do another commission. <coughs> and I approached a composer who I thought would be absolutely perfect for the assignment, someone who had written a wonderful piece for a kind of children's occasion, and said, why don't we do something that somehow reflects on Margaret Mahi's Lion in the Meadow? I thought it could be, you know, it could be a piece where you had a narrator, it could be something sung, it might be something totally different, it might be something that alludes in some ways, uses the visuals in that book. Now, as you probably know, that, that children's book started life in the New Zealand School Journal, and after having been noticed in 1968 by an American edi editor, went on to become an international hit. It's been translated into 15 different languages, including very early in its history, German. So, you know, if you're going to do a piece with a narrator, you could, you know, just insert whichever version of the, of the, of the narration you need. I thought it was a neat idea. Anyway, the composer was very pleased to be asked, and, and you know, so that was good, that was positive. But um, I'm trying to avoid using gender here. To <laughs> <laughs> but the composer said to me, um, the lion in the, lion in the meadow is not the right story because it's actually not distinctively New Zealand, and suggested another. So clearly we needed at least a silver fern somewhere as a guarantee of authenticity. I think that's a sad story myself. Um, there is, I feel, something concerning about using icons like the silver fern um, uh, in, to identify compositions or anything as distinctively New Zealand. <coughs> and by way of conclusion, I really want to quote extensively from this wonderful essay by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, he, he wrote an essay on the Argentinian writer and tradition in 1951. So this makes a really fascinating comparison with Douglas's search for a tradition because it's just a few, you know, six years, five years later. <coughs> Borges reflects out of, uh, he, he rejects out of hand the idea that Argentinian writers need to choose local subjects or incorporate local color. And this is what he says. I do not know if it needs to be said that the idea that a literature must define itself by the differential traits of the country that produces it is a relatively new one. And the idea that writers must seek out subjects local to their countries is also new and arbitrary. Without going back any further, I think Racine would not have begun to understand anyone who would deny him his right to the title of French poet for having sought out Greek and Latin subjects. I think Shakespeare, would have been astonished if anyone had tried to limit him to English subjects, and if anyone had told him that as an Englishman he had no right to write Hamlet with its Scandinavian subject matter or Macbeth on a Scottish theme. He goes on to observe that there are no camels in the Quran. He says, a few days ago, I discovered a curious confirmation of the way in which what is truly native can and often does dispense with local colour. I found this confirmation in Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. 
Gibbon observes that in the Arab book par excellence, the Quran, there are no camels. I believe if there were any doubt as to the authenticity of the Quran, this absence of camels would be sufficient to prove it is Arab. It was written by Muhammad, and Muhammad, as an Arab, had no reason to know that camels were particularly Arab. <laughs> they were for him a part of reality, and he had no reason to single them out. While the first thing a forger, a tourist, or an Arab nationalist would do is bring on the camels, whole <laughs> caravans of camels on every page. But Muhammad, as an Arab, was unconcerned. He knew he could be Arab without camels. I think we Argentinians can be like Muhammad. We can believe in the possibility of being Argentine without abounding in local color. Such a view, of course, is directly at odds with the manifesto that Lilburn promulgate, promulgated with A Search for Tradition. By the time he was writing A Search for a, for a Language in 1969, however, he'd moved a lot closer to Borges' perspective, or at least he had recognized that the vision of a single recognizable New Zealand style was illusory. Partly this was simply a recognition that our society was evolving, becoming less apparently monocultural with an education system and a pattern of immigration that were far more open to influences from Asia, Africa and continental Europe, not just the United Kingdom. I would like to think that uh, in the light of the way his own ideas evolved, Douglas would not be altogether unhappy if I were to take the liberty of adapting Borges' conclusion to our own situation um, here in New Zealand. So I'm just going to alter the Argentinian language here. Um, we must not be afraid. We must believe that the universe is our birthright and try out every subject. We cannot confine ourselves to what is New Zealand in order to be a New Zealand artist because either it is our inevitable destiny to be a New Zealand artist, in which case we will be a New Zealand artist whatever we do, or being a New Zealand artist as a mere affectation, a mask. I believe that if we lose ourselves in the voluntary dream called artistic creation, we will be New Zealanders, and we will be, as well, good or adequate artists, composers. And uh, rather than leave Borgers with the last word, I'm going to hand over to Douglas, who said in a search for a language, I suggest that the true lesson of all of this is that human experience is the valid and essentially unique thing, be it in Warsaw or, as Dennis Glover said, in Johnsonville and Geraldine. Thank you. <laughs>